What we're going to look at is how to parse out repeating data in hierarchical data or hierarchical data, like a JSON payload or an XML payload. In this case, we've got uh, a JSON string here, which we'd like to parse and to get out the individual rows of information that are here. And the first thing I'm going to do is just beautify this so it's a little easier to see. This makes it easier to see the structure of the data. So we have a topmost property called row set. Um, this is an object which has an OS name, DB name, table name, and a few other things. And then a little bit further down, we have the repeating data. We have a rows property, which is an array of objects, each one with a name and a GID. So what we're going to do is to parse this into individual entries with this individual information, name and GID, but also including the, the common information at the row set level to get this information into TDI to be able to do the parsing. There are a number of approaches. One thing I like to do is to just create a script and we'll call this test JSON and then just paste in the whatever it is. Now we'll get messages here because it's going to be doing some JavaScript verification and, and this JSON is not going to cut muster when it comes to JavaScript, and that's fine. And then I'm going to create a new assembly line. And just add an empty script. I like to work with empty scripts when I'm starting to play with something. And then we can say JSON equals system get script text test JSON. And that just loads the string from this script object into a variable. I could also, in this case, because it was a one-liner, I also could have used single quotes and then just pasted the string in place here, since there are double quotes in the string. So either one of these will work. Then the next step here is to convert or, or to, um, I like to create an object out of it. And I like to work with JavaScript objects. So if we just make a JS obj equals from JSON, JSON. So now we have a, J, a JavaScript object. Now I'm going to, in addition, as I had mentioned before, there are some values here at this level the OS name, DB name, uh, cold desk with the name, type, and size, and so on and so forth. So the question here is how we want to represent this information. And that's a decision we make when we start turning these into attributes and putting them into an entry. I could, of course, simply convert the entire JSON payload into one hierarchical entry which then contains all this information. But that's not going to give me that set of entries that I want, because oftentimes in my assembly line, I'll be working with non-hierarchical data, working with uh, directories or database tables or whatever. And it's nice to flatten this out to make it easier to work with. So let's really just grab the uh, OS name, DB name, table name, and affected rows for the time being as the common properties or common attributes, and then take the individual ones to create the entries that we want to return. So to do this, I'm going to, in the first case, just use a loop. So we'll set up a conditional loop, and that is uh, comes with the text while, so while more entries. And then we need to get a hold of a couple of things. We can say, for example, that the, the rows equals JS obj dot, let's take a look at what we've got here, row set rows. And we can say that the index is set to zero. So now our while loop if we script our while loop 
we can say that index is less than rows.length. So as long as the index is less than rows.length, we'll continue to step through here. So let's under, go underneath here and we'll create another empty script. And this one we'll call uh, parse entries. And this one I'm going to rename to initialize. All right, so at this point, when we get down here to parse entries, we have this JS option, which contains the row set, which contains, and we have the rows variable and the index variable. So we can say now that uh, current row equals rows, square bracket index, and I'm going to increment index while I remember to do it. And then we're going to clean out what's in work right now. And then we're going to go through the row, the current row, and take all the values there and put them into work. For prop in current row, which gives us a loop, prop will be the name of each property as it works its way through that JavaScript object. And then we'll say work an attribute with the name prop will be equal to the current row. And then we just dereference that property by using again square brackets. So this will create entries for us. If we just want to test to see how well this is working, let's add a dump entry as well. Oops and I'll drag that on top of the while loop so it then shows up here at the bottom subordinate to it. So if we run this, we're expecting it to simply parse out those uh, couple of properties for each row, place them in the work entry, and then we dump out the work entry. So we had five objects that were written out, our loop cycled five times, and we have name probe, GID, name public, system, and so on. If we take a look at our data again, we'll see that that's the information that was there. So now what we want to do is add the top level objects as well. And I'm going to do that a bit programmatically. So in addition to these, I'm going to say for prop in js obj row set. And as we step through this object, uh, the, we'll see that the value of some of these properties are strings and a number, but the values of others are objects. An array in JavaScript is an object. So if we just check to see if the type is of type object, we skip it for right now. And then we can come back later if we want to and, and then parse those uh, sub-objects as well, and put information, put that information into work too. So in the code, we'll just simply say if js obj row set prop, and I forgot type of, if type of is not equal to object, then we'll add them to work. All right, so now we're adding a few more attributes. If we run this, we're now getting the OS name, the table name, and affected rows. Now I'm doing it here in a while loop, and, and it could be that that's, that's sufficient for doing what you need to do here in, uh, in an assembly line. But if you need this to be in the feed section, then another option would be to either script your own connector or to take a built-in connector that we have and simply override the get next and put your logic there. And I'm going to take that second approach now. So let's just make a copy of this assembly line. And we'll call that 
v2. And in this case, we're going to add a form entry connector, which is, a, which is the developer's friend. This is a very simple connector, which works like a file in that it has a parser. We can set up a parser and then read some sort of a byte stream. But that byte stream, instead of coming from a file, is actually written here. It's written to this property. I'm going to click on the label here so we can see. The entry raw data property. So by setting this property, and I can do this programmatically also in my assembly line, I can push information to a form entry connector and then have it parsed. But we're going to tell it that we want this guy to uh, loop infinitely. And then in the hooks, in the prolog before initialization, I'm going to put my initialize code. And then in the override get next, here I'm going to put the code which actually is going to parse it. Let me just copy all this for the time being. So, current row index, index plus plus, this is all the same. And we probably need a little if test here as well because since the if test or the check for the length against the length is done here in the while, we need to be able to say here if index less than rows.length, then we want to do all this. Else we want to return that we've run out of data at this point. So when we are able to find data, we want to say result set status 1, meaning data has been found. Otherwise, we set set status 0, which indicates end of data. Let's take a quick look at the hooks to see what happens when we override. So when we override the get next, then we're skipping all of this, including the input map, which is why I'm putting the data directly into the work entry. We don't need this code, so we'll just disable these. And then I'll add an, a dump entry here just to the data flow. And let's take a quick run and see how this works. And we see now this works in the same way. We're getting back this information as separate entries. But now it's coming from our iterator, which means that we've got a, a more standard organization of our assembly line, and we get all the feed data flow functionality like end of, uh, end of flow features, which include things like, you know, you can set commit for database writes to end of flow. You can set commits to things like Delta engine commits and uh, iterator state keys. But this is just a quick way uh, or a quick demonstration of how to parse out hierarchical data, and in this case, JSON. We could have used the same techniques, uh, pretty much the same techniques for XML, except instead of parsing it to a JavaScript object as we've done here, we could parse them to a, a hierarchical entry. And, and this is done by using a from JSON method or function, which is a static function of the entry class. So I can either refer to it using the full package, com.ibm.di.entry.entry.fromjson, or by just borrowing an entry object which I have access to at this point. So doing this returns a hierarchical entry. If I want the XML version of this JSON, I can just simply say XML equals H entry to XML. And you'll notice that the from 
JSON to JSON from XML are, are capital for JSON and XML when we're talking about the entry functions. And that concludes this little presentation.